So, uh, yes, yeah, so it is being recorded now. During the presentation, I request you to write your questions or comments in the chat box. Also, mute yourself when you are not speaking. Uh, and raise your hand if you would like to say something during Q and uh, question and answer session after the presentation. As a, brief, as a brief introduction to our uh, presenter, Abib Saladak obtained a, P, a BSc in Math and Physics from Tel Aviv University and a MSc in Physics from Wiseman Institute of Science in Israel. He later completed a PhD in Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences at UCLA, where he is currently a postdoctoral researcher. During his MSc, Abib investigated air sea interaction and heat exchange. During his PhD, he investigated processes causing instability of shower metal material exchange and vortex formation in oceanic currents using both numerical simulations and theory, with a focus on currents which form part of overturning circulation in the northern Atlantic. Abib also conducted observational research with the UCLA marine operations studying coastal circulation dynamics in the Gulf of Mexico. He is presently studying the overturning circulation in the Southern Ocean, as well as the dynamics of transport of material between the coastal and deep ocean regions. So without much due, I hand over the session to Abib. Abib. Yeah, thank you very much for this introduction. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll start to uh, share my screen to you. One second, please. Um, here we go. Okay, so um, today I present work I did together with uh, uh, my postdoc advisor Andrew Su at UCLA, as well as Andy Hogg in uh, Australian National University and Georgi Manuchalian at University of Washington. And I'll be talking about uh, reconstruction of the meridional return circulation in the ocean uh, based on uh, satellite observations. And uh, specifically, this is uh, uh, a test bed of uh, methodology we developed for this within numerical model. And I'm sorry that the title here is actually slightly wrong. Uh, so first, what is the uh, meridional return circulation of the ocean? It's basically the largest um, circulation pattern uh, in, in the global oceans, the largest so, so, um, 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 coherent pattern and such. And uh, to explain, uh, in polar uh, regions, uh, water becomes uh, denser through uh, cooling and, uh, and other processes related to salt uh, fluxes. And, uh, as it uh, densif densifies, it uh, it uh, um, um, it uh, descends to the abyss. So here's a illustration of this with the arrows. Um, heat fluxes here at the surface cause the densification and sinking of dense water around the Antarctic margins here, as well as in, in the North Atlantic Ocean in the subpolar regions here. And uh, you can see this leads to uh, basically, the global patterns of uh, of any sort of um, uh, property distribution in the ocean. So, for example, in the top you see the um, a plot of the oxygen distribution in the ocean. It's very smooth, but uh, but it's it's uh, but it's based on actual values measurements. And um, this is in the Atlantic uh, Ocean, a uh, meridional section. You can see how uh, the sinking of Antarctic bottom water causes the base to be filled with younger water, higher oxygen, less utilized oxygen, and the same uh, for the Atlantic water that is formed, uh, the North Atlantic deep water, and tr trans um, and propagates along the mid-ocean uh, depth. So Atlantic, uh, the North Atlantic deep water formed, uh, um, fills the intermediate depths of the ocean, and the, Atl and the Antarctic bottom water uh, is the densest water mass in the global ocean and fills the abyss. Um, you can also see uh, this, their effect in uh, the distributions of uh, sal salinity here. Again, Antarctic bottom water, uh, 
propagates here uh, to the abyss and, and northwards within the Atlantic Ocean. You can see the section here, and it's uh, fresher than the North Atlantic deep water from the in the North Atlantic and propagating southward. Um, so they control the distribution of temperature, salinity, and hence density, and therefore they the pressure distribution in the ocean and and the pathways. So in uh, they, they don't just propagate passively due to some other effects, but they determine the global distribution of uh, density uh, and the circulation that is consistent with that. Um, so it's very it's very important to understand um, um, the mechanisms controlling this this uh, this global uh, uh, circulation pattern uh, and also the its variability and the causes of it. Here we're, showing, we're looking at some long time average of these properties, but the actual circulation varies on many time scales. Uh, so uh, to talk a little bit more about uh, the importance uh, of the meridional return circulation. Let's uh, focus on the Atlantic meridional return circulation, by which I mean this intermediate depth cell formed by North Atlantic deep water. Um, so on the left panel, you see the uh, meridional heat transport <clears throat> in the ocean atmosphere system. And it's in, uh, and in the northern hemisphere, you see that there is northward transport of heat, uh, which is uh, to a large degree by the ocean. And I'm not showing the decomposition to oceans here, but it's mostly in the Atlantic Ocean. You can see it can be as large as the atmospheric transport of heat uh, in the tropics, and it can be about a quarter or so uh, of the total, uh, say, at 30 knots. So it's a substantial meridional transport of heat in the Atlantic Ocean, and it's largely controlled by the meridional return circulation, uh, although this part doesn't show that. Uh, and th the effect of this northward heat transport in the Atlantic uh, is significant. It moderates um, winter temperatures in Europe. It uh, affects uh, hurricane intensity and frequency, um, uh, monsoon, uh, monsoonal atmospheric circulations in, in Africa and in the Americas. It's, it's been shown to have many important effects, and, it, some, and hence it's important to understand and be able to um, uh, predict its, uh, its variability in the future, especially uh, under the uh, global uh, climate change that we're experiencing right now due to anthropogenic uh, effects. Um, and uh, additionally, the Atlantic uh, meridional Italian circulation strength, I'll just say more from now on for short, has been uh, shown to decrease uh, in over the last uh, decades. Now it's it's still somewhat uncertain. Here I'm showing uh, a reconstruction of this based on a proxy related to surface temperatures uh, in the Atlantic, because we only have um, Atlantic or, or MOC uh, measurements from the last uh, several decades with confidence from direct or semi-direct observations. So there is there is uh, there is evidence by now fairly substantial evidence uh, that uh, there has been a slowdown and, uh, and that there are significant decadal oscillations, but we really need to, to better uh, observe it in the future and, and understand what, what uh, causes that and how it will change under uh, climate change. Uh, now the Atl Atlantic bottom, uh, I'm sorry, Antarctic bottom water, which forms a deeper part of the mock, um, is also a very important um, uh, uh, component to track. So first, it, it just feels about a third of the global volume of abyssal water. That's a very large uh, fraction. So here you see the thickness of water source from Antarctic bottom water um, uh, globally, thickness in meters. So you see it, it is several kilometers thick uh, in many parts of the, of the South Atlantic, Indian, and Pacific Oceans. So it affects the uh, Estratification circulation in all of these areas. And furthermore, it, it has also shown uh, uh, changes in, in recent decades. Uh, for example, it has the Antarctic bottom water in the abyssal layers uh, around the Southern Ocean has, have warmed up uh, and hence decreased in density. Uh, so they're not as dense as, as they used to, used to be, and also have decreased in, uh, in thickness. Uh, so there's been uh, less of uh, these waters produced and, uh, and, and with slightly uh, warmer temperatures, also fresher, which I'm not showing here. And uh, it's not uh, well understood yet um, how this happens and, and in, from which regions it's, it's in, uh, this, in, these changes are uh, emanating from. Uh, and there's uh, 
it's imperative to understand uh, these questions as well as which regions will be influenced by it in this global distribution of, of inductive bottom water. Uh, furthermore, um, the, the MOC uh, controls, uh, largely controls the uh, um, oceanic uh, uptake of carbon from the atmosphere, including anthropogenic, anthropogenic CO2 that we emit. So uh, a large fraction of, of emitted uh, CO2 has been so far uh, captured in the oceans, buffering somewhat cli uh, climate change, except that it affects ocean acidification as well and uh, another aspect of ocean circulation, uh, but it's not in the atmosphere. So uh, it, uh, for at one kilometer depth, for example, you can see that the regions where the concentration of, uh, of the CO2 that has, of, that has been absorbed from the atmosphere is largely determined by where deep water formation occurs. So again, in the North Atlantic, where North Atlantic deep water uh, is formed and, and sink, uh, as well as in the uh, Southern Ocean, where Antarctic bottom water is formed along the continental margins of Antarctica. Uh, so this, these circulations are uh, important in terms of um, the continual uh, mitigation, mitigation of uh, climate change in this regard, which is expected to continue for a limited time. As well as for the, um, um, as well as for the um, controlling this reservoir of CO two in the global ocean, which controls climate um, viability over longer time scales, uh, and has in in, uh, in the deep past as well, from uh, different paleo evidence. Um, so, how can we monitor? Or how, how have we been monitoring the the mock in the past? Uh, so with difficulty. Um, so the first, the classical method in uh, physical oceanography uh, to do so, or to measure anything in the deep ocean, any sort of uh, uh, circulation, has been to measure uh, uh, density in the ocean. So uh, we lower these, in, these big instruments from big ships, they're called CTDs, and we lower them into uh, the depth, the uh, range we wish to, to, to measure, several kilometers, you can imagine it takes uh, a while to lower them, bring them back, uh, to get to these areas with chips. And it's very expensive to operate uh, large chips for research, including. Uh, so here's a, uh, here is a map of, the, uh, of, the, of, of lines which are, um, which are measured uh, with the decadal uh, frequency, more or less, so about once or several times a decade. You can see they're not plentiful, and the, the gaps between them are large. So the temporal aliasing from this sort of measurement is uh, can be severe, um, as well as spatial ali aliasing. And uh, I'll just explain briefly how, how this works, will be useful later. So it's all based on geostrophic balance. Uh, so the leading balance of uh, uh, the leading balance of uh, uh, momentum uh, in, uh, tendency in the ocean is uh, between uh, horizontal, the horizontal pressure gradient force and the Coriolis force, since it's a rotating system. The Coriolis force is proportional to, uh, to the velocity, to the horizontal velocity, and the pressure gradient force is proportional to the horizontal density gradient. So if one measures the density gradient, one can infer the velocity. There are some issues with that, but that's, but uh, there are, uh, but it's, it's a method that has been uh, in use and uh, uh, for a long time. And there are ways to deal with these uh, limitations as well. Um, and so, so again, this is a method which is, which, by which we obtain very sparse and uh, frequency limited measurements. Uh, in uh, more recent decades, there's also been acoustic measurements from chips of, of, of velocity, but they're limited to the upper uh, ocean, unless one lowers those acoustic instruments on lines to measure deeper. Uh, which you can imagine is also very slow endeavor. So it hasn't really improved very much our uh, ability to, to uh, monitor the, the return of the circulation, um, the incorporation of the acoustical techniques. So, um, so this, there are a few other methods which uh, uh, in the interest of time I will not review, but the state of the art, the gold standard right now in trying to monitor the uh, return of the circulation is uh, in situ monitoring arrays and uh, a longest standing example of this is called the Rapid Mock Array. It's a US uh, uh, UK co collaboration. 
and it's at uh, it's at the line around 26 and a half knot in the Atlantic, which you can see here. And um, by the way, I just uh, just a call me if if you have if if there are any questions during the talk, uh, please feel free to ask. We don't have to wait until the end. Um, so. Okay, so uh, okay, so you can see here a vertical section at this area, and you can see that several full depth uh, arrays have been placed in water, and there is uh, uh, instruments for measuring temperature, salinity, pressure, and also in some of these regions, uh, velocity directly, and it's a very expensive uh, uh, and logistically difficult uh, monitoring array to maintain. So. It's, it's been very valuable over the last uh, almost two decades that it's been in operation. Uh, but uh, I think the funding for this has decreased a bit and they had to uh, trim it a little bit. Uh, and it's not certain how much this will continue in the future. Um, now, there are a few other arrays like it that have since been uh, uh, put in place. Uh, the, there's the Samba, 34 and a half south, and there's Osnap at, 40, at uh, about 47 north and a couple others that have been sort of on and off operating. And all of them are just a few years by now. And, um, and some of them are more limited in, in terms of what they measure. So the Atlantic is covered by a few of these. Again, not, not all of years and not certain how longer it will uh, uh, last. Uh, but here's a schematic of the global uh, meridional return circulation. And now it's sort of a 3D schematic. And uh, this is the Atlantic uh, part, but of course we have the Indian Ocean, Pacific Ocean, Southern Ocean, they're all interconnected with this global uh, cell, which is, more, which is sort of like, a, well, it's more complex even than a figure eight, but it's often sort of envisioned as a figure eight through this uh, 3D space. And we're only monitoring continuously, semi-continuously in the Atlantic. So we need to do better. Um, and uh, one, one direction, uh, one possible direction is to utilize satellite measurements. So uh, satellites have been in use uh, for uh, climate science and oceanography for uh, several decades now, and they've revol revolutionized, uh, they've been one of the revolutions in, in oceanography in terms of the sheer capacity of volume of measurements and uh, that we, we have access to uh, and have led to many innovations. Um, and there have been some attempts to use uh, satellite data uh, for, uh, for mock studies. So zonal wind stress is one of the variables that have, that are, or wind stress in general, is one of the variables that are measured from satellites. Uh, and it is in fact uh, used in all of these monitoring arrays that I'm showing here, because they can only measure uh, uh, well the circulation under uh, say 100 meters or so, and at the top uh, part of the ocean, the wind-driven circulation is, is, uh, is dominant. And so they use the, the wind stress from satellites, uh, from satellite data. Um, sea surface temperature has also been linked with the, uh, with the mock uh, variability. So basically, there's this, uh, excuse me, I haven't silenced my phone. Um, so basically, there's, uh, there's zonal and meridional uh, patterns of sea surface temperature, which uh, have sort of fingerprint typical uh, uh, changes to them under uh, different uh, uh, anomalies of the, of the mock strength. So people have shown that they're related and there is some predictive power in, the, in sea surface temperature or reconstructive power. Uh, Additionally, uh, there are variables which are related to, to pressure in the ocean, which are measured from satellite. Uh, so sea surface height, which influences the pressure under it, and again, by geostrophic balance, determines uh, velocity. As, so sea surface height has been measured from satellites from several decades and uh, has been very successfully used in various studies of, of the uh, upper ocean circulation, but it could uh, uh, possibly be used uh, for deeper circulation as well. And there's been some limited success in doing so um, in conjunction with in situ measurements in the Atlantic, uh, but not on its own. And ocean bottom pressure uh, is also measured uh, uh, by the GRAY satellite uh, that, uh, that NASA operates. And um, it, again, by geostrophy, it should, it should, um, it is related to the uh, velocity uh, in the bottom of the ocean. So basically exactly what the, the deepest uh, part of the mock is or the Antarctic bottom water. 
um, which we aim to understand its viability. Um, and uh, more theoretic, uh, theoretic I'll, I'll, I'll cover one more theoretical uh, uh, reason why uh, satellite data uh, or how satellite data can be used to infer the deep mock uh, viability. So for that, we need to look at the Southern Ocean and here's uh, sort of a stream function on, uh, or uh, streamlines of the flow in the surface of the, of the Southern Ocean. You can see there's this eastward uh, unimpeded, uh, unimpeded uh, streamlines. And this is the Antarctic circumpolar current, which is uh, um, partially driven by just east easterly wind stress in, the, in this region. And uh, this current is a very deep current. It reaches all the way to deep bridge systems in the region. Now, due to just traffic constraints, as, as, the, as this Antarctic circumpolar current reaches a ridge, uh, sort of travels eastward and meets it, it needs to do a meander, sort of a roundabout, it goes a little bit north and comes back. And that's associated by geostrophy with a decrease in the sea surface height and appropriate pressure uh, changes beneath it. Now, um, if there's a, if there's an Antarctic bottom water flow uh, under it, then the uh, meandering of the Antarctic circumpolar current uh, that influences the pressure and hence the uh, momentum balance at the bottom and cause it, and any and any changes any anomalies in the uh, in the surface uh, uh, transport would be reflected in anomalies in the bottom transport and that that has been shown uh, quantitatively by uh, Stuart and Hogg <coughs> 2016 um, and uh, recently we published a paper which has uh, quantified this uh, uh, and and utilized this effect um, and we've shown that in time scales of uh, up to up to several years, there is a fast adjustment due to what's called allotropic Rossby waves. Basically, pressure waves of pressure uh, uh, adjustment, which are uh, which have no depth dependence, they reach all the way to the bottom uh, without diminished amplitude. And uh, they uh, and and the bottom line is that uh, there is a strong correlation between Antarctic bottom water export, so the the bottom mock strength. In, uh, in blue here with, uh, with wind stress. So you can see the correlation here as a function of, uh, of the time in days, of the time of variability. And it's, it's a decent uh, value of variability, about 0.8. But we asked ourselves, uh, can we do better? Uh, so, so this means that you know, if we use satellite to wind stress data in the Southern Ocean, we can get a decent correlation uh, and reconstruct the bottom uh, uh, mock variability. But can we do better? Is there more information in these satellite observables, the bottom the ocean bottom pressure, the uh, system side, so wind stress and others? Uh, is there more information there that we can uh, uh, mine, even if we don't understand completely uh, how to do it uh, from a theoretical perspective? So we, we know the bottom pressure uh, variations should be related to directly, uh, not just through the wind stress, uh, should be related to the, uh, to the transport variability. Uh, but due to the bottom topography being so rough, uh, it's uh, difficult to, um, to um, th the, the relation is a bit more complicated than it, than is, uh, uh, and uh, given that the course uh, um, measurement, uh, special, sorry, special resolution of the measurement uh, from satellites. So if, if one measures it uh, from a satellite, you average over uh, 100 kilometers or so, the ocean bottom pressure, whereas the, the bottom uh, slope varies, and that complicates the geostrophic relation. And uh, it's not clear a priori how to relate these variables. Um, so we uh, therefore uh, decided to, to look into this from a machine learning perspective and try to see what is sort of the maximum amount of information we can get, and then, which might serve to develop uh, an actual uh, working uh, uh, reconstruction system for the mock the sun satellite data, or might be also useful for uh, better understanding the book theoretically to develop a better theoretical model of that um, and inform a, a more dynamical based um, reconstruction. So first, we, we are doing what's called a perfect observing system test, uh, or, or um, uh, and we're using a, a numerical model, numerical simulation of the ocean. It's called ECHO, ECHO4. Uh, and it's a numerical simulation uh, which respects all the conservation laws of the ocean, momentum conservation, and so on. Uh, but all, at the same time, also assimilates measurements uh, 
um, in order to optimize sort of parameters which are uh, uh, lesser constrained uh, in oceanography. So it's it's this self consistent method uh, which does both uh, um, fully consistent uh, equations of motions and and a simulation of observations and the name of this method is uh, state estimate and we use the ECOFOR state estimate in order to uh, sample variables which are in principle measured from satellites but we measure them here from the from the model or just sample them from the model as if we have satellite observations and then uh, we use the data in order to uh, try to predict the Maidon return circulation variability within the model. So here's what the um, Meridian on return circulation looks in the model, looks like in the model. In the Southern Ocean, you see the, the stream function. So blue means uh, um, counterclockwise motion and red means clockwise motion in this vertical plane. You can see the abyssal moxel here of Antarctic bottom water. In the Atlantic, you can see the, uh, what's called the Atlantic moco A moxel, as well as the deeper signature of the uh, Southern Ocean cell which also uh, pervades the Indo-Pacific oceans, which we treat together. So we call this green patch here, well, the green patch here is the Atlantic. The, uh, the orange is the, what we combine together is the uh, Indo-Pacific. And the Southern Ocean we define south of 35 south. Um, so again, we are, so for example, uh, to, to explain the methodology, let's take an, an example of uh, uh, reconstructing the mock at, at a particular latitude, uh, say 26 knots. And uh, so we have a distribution of variables there. Let's see? Yeah. So, for example, uh, zonal wind stress, sea surface height, and ocean bottom pressure as a function of longitude here at a given time. Uh, and we have the strength of the, of the meridian of the time circulation at the, at the given time as well. Here I'm showing a time in, but at the given time, we can also deduce its strength, which uh, a simple metric of it is just a maximal value of the stream function at a given time. We use a slightly different uh, uh, metric, um, which I won't go into, but it's, uh, it gives similar results. Uh, and here you see the complete time series of the, of the mock in red at 26 knot in the, in the model. And basically we're trying to reconstruct it um, based on the on, on this on the distribution of these variables um, and uh, we use a training period uh, shown in gray here in which we train the model the neural network and then we predict the last uh, part in white here um, so just a, a little uh, uh, digression into uh, neural networks uh, so hopefully everyone knows a little bit about it but if not I'll, I'll uh, give a little introduction so neural networks um, in the present uh, context uh, uh, are used to uh, reconstruct um, time series um, based, on, uh, based on other proxy variables. So we have, as an example, some three proxy variables, sorry, two proxy variables, x1 and x2, and uh, we want to predict uh, z, some time series. So we have time series of x1 and x2. Uh, and uh, we have some training period at which we have x1, and x2, and also z, and we all, we want to reconstruct z for outside of the training period in which we don't have z, for example. So the way this works is there's what's called the hidden layer, where there are uh, neurons, and here there are three neurons, y1, y2, and y3, and uh, each neuron receives as an input at any time sample, at any time, receives an input that the values from x1 and x2 variables multiplied by some weights, w, w is here with some indices. You can see here as an example, y1 receives x1 multiplied by w11 plus x2 by w21 plus a bias term. And similarly for y2 and y3, they all have their own weights. And the, what happens is that during the learning phase, the weights are optimized in order to, to give the best prediction z. So we try to minimize the deviation of z from the real z. Uh, uh, that is given in the training phase. Um, and uh, that's, that's basically the, the crux of it. Of course, there's a technical way to, to train the neural network called backpropagation, and there's various methodologies to, to optimize it, uh, which I won't go into here in detail. Um, and I'll, I'll add that uh, overfitting during the training phase sh should be limited. So basically, we don't want to 
fit too well the training phase beyond um, so it, so it can generalize to other data. And uh, I'll highlight one aspect of it is that uh, we we try to to limit the, the the amplitude of the weights. This is common practice. So we, instead of minimizing uh, uh, the z deviation, we minimize z deviation plus uh, the sum of the amplitudes of the weights squared times some coefficient, right? Um, and this serves to over uh, to limit overfitting uh, because you can't you balance uh, giving uh, larger weights to, larger amplitudes to many weights versus um, uh, in order to better uh, better fit versus uh, choosing a, a smaller sample of significant weights uh, and getting a, a more decent fit and that limits uh, overtraining. All right, uh, so how does it work in our case? We have the zonal distribution of the, of the variables such as uh, wind stress, high surface height and ocean bottom pressure. And uh, we do some uh, pre-processing such as uh, the trending and the scaling. I won't go into it um, unless there's interest, but it's pretty standard. Then we concatenate at a given time, we concatenate these different dis zonal distributions. And this is all at latitude per latitude. So at any latitude, we train the neural network uh, separately. Uh, so uh, we form this uh, long uh, array of, uh, of uh, zonal, zonal uh, distributions. And then we pass this data on to, to, the, to the neurons. And uh, we find one layer, one hidden layer of neurons is enough to to, to achieve uh, skillful reconstruction uh, in this model and of, of the mock. And uh, this is sensible in light that there are only uh, 24 years of uh, uh, numerical simulation here. And uh, so uh, basically larger layers, you, you quickly get to uh, many more weights and you have degrees of freedom in the time series. So you will basically overtrain. Doesn't, it's not, uh, doesn't pay off. And it's uh, so this is a, a fully connected feed forward network, neural network. It's a technical term for it that just explained the architecture. And I'll also say that we use what's called Bayesian interpolation, which is a training method which uh, uh, sort of uh, optimally chooses this uh, coefficient for the, for the regulariz regularization that uh, limits over training. So it's a Bayesian framework for uh, uh, choosing the, uh, the regularization, which uh, best uh which best reconstructs data um okay so let's uh dig into the results um so uh let's start with atlantic and uh and first i'll show results from one specific latitude in the atlantic and one specific latitude in the in the southern ocean let me just go back there for a second yeah so i'll show 26 north in the Atlantic and 60 south in the Southern Ocean. And uh, the reason I'm choosing this was, or is best to show it? Sorry. Um, I'll just show it here. Um, yeah. The, so 26 north is you know, useful for comparison with the, the rapid MOCA array that is there. Uh, and and uh, 60 south is useful because it's a very different dynamical regime. There, is no, there are no, no zonal boundaries. So we have this circumpolar uh, current we've talked about and, uh, and different dynamics. And we will use this to kind of, uh, these two latitudes to, to test the methodology adapt. And then I'll show you results for uh, uh, almost global results after that. Uh, okay, so this is uh, just one layer with three neurons. And uh, we see here a high correlation, uh, 0.98 um, for, uh, the, for the uh, testing phase. And if you if you're wondering if you're uh, familiar with the decomposition of data to for neural networks to um, uh, training, validation, and testing, and I'm not showing any validation phase, just testing. That's because the, with the Bayesian uh, framework, there's no need for a validation phase. It, it does it all together in the in the training phase. That's a technical uh, side note. Um, so, and another uh, note is that I'm showing here results, the median results of the reconstruction after 20 realizations of the neural network, 20 realizations of the, with different number, number um, random initializations of the weights in the neural network initialization. Uh, so it's a very robust result. Um, 
And similarly in the Southern Ocean, we also get a very high correlation. So this was very surprised, surprising to me the first time I've seen it, uh, how well this approach works. Um, and we can look at uh, kind of specific time scales of variability. Uh, so there's interest in understanding the uh, variability over longer time scales rather than monthly, for example, because uh, the main importance of the mock is that it transports material properties. And you know, if, it, if there's a lot of oscillation, fast oscillations, it's likely to do so uh, less well than over a longer time scale. So uh, we limit, we apply a low pass filter, for example, with a six months uh, um, um, limit to the band pass. Uh, and uh, we, we filter both the, the input variables and the mock time series. And, and the correlation is still quite high here, uh, both in the Atlantic Ocean and the, South, and the Southern Ocean. Uh, and here I'm showing the same thing, but in the bottom panels, I'm, I'm showing um, the results of, of uh, uh, the reconstruction scale or correlation as a function of the low pass filter width. So we can look at how well it does for variability with different time scales. And for the Atlantic Ocean, um, um, we see that uh, there is some decrease in skill, it gets to about 0.8 after about uh, a year and stays at until two years. And I'll mention we have 24 years of data. So, you know, there's not a lot of two year chunks here. So potentially with the longer uh, time series, one can do, one can do better, but that's uh, 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 speculation. And I'm also showing here results with different number of neurons. So you can see that you get diminishing re returns once you increase the number of neurons, but basically better, more than three is not worthwhile here. Um, and in the Southern Ocean, we see that the skill remains basically undiminished for uh, even two year time scales of viability. Um, so uh, that's very encouraging. And also one neuron is sort of uh, optimal here for the longer time scales maybe makes sense because again there's less degrees of freedom in the time series so you don't want to overfit there um okay so how long of a record do we actually need uh, i've shown you results with uh, uh using a 70 percent of the time series um for the uh of the 24 years for for uh for the training but what's actually needed and that's that's interesting in that you know there's uh just about two decades of satellite data uh, depending on the variable you're looking at. Uh, so is, th is that actually sufficient? Um, so we see that here we see the uh, scale of reconstruction as a function of the uh, fraction of the, of the data set used for training. And the scale I'm showing here is the, the coefficient of determination uh, squared, which is basically um, uh, roughly equivalent to uh, the fraction of variability in the time series we wish to reconstruct that is actually accounted for by the reconstruction. So it's a little bit like correlation squared. It, 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 it tends, it's pretty similar in value for the higher values, <clears throat> but it uh, drops uh, faster for lower correlation values <clears throat> uh, and is arguably a, a more relevant uh, statistic for those uh, lower skill cases. So let's look, let's look at it uh, for the Atlantic uh, Ocean. For one neuron in blue, we see that uh, it reaches sort of max near maximum scale around 40, 50% of the time series, just, just over 10 years. And with the more neurons, uh, you can do better for very small fractions of the train set, just a few years, but you reach similar values later. And there are similar results for the Southern Ocean, then you can do even better with very small uh, fractions, just a couple of years of the data set. So that's that's encouraging in terms of the fact that of, in terms of uh, comparison with the, the length of available uh, satellite data. Um, and next, we we wish to uh, to uh, determine which combination of satellite variables might be optimal. Satellite observable variables might be optimal for the current goal. Um, sorry, so. Starting in the Atlantic Ocean, we see ocean bottom pressure uh, as a, uh, almost as well as a combination of uh, of ocean or is there, sorry, of ocean bottom pressure, system site, and zonal wind stress, or ocean bottom pressure and zonal wind stress, uh, and zonal wind stress uh, does 
as well as ocean bottom pressure alone. So uh, the combination of those seems uh, to work the best where CSFS height uh, does not add much. We've also tested CSFS temperature or CSFS salinity. And again, they do not add much um, actually degrade because uh, they cause some overfitting um, without adding much inform uh, additional information apparently. <clears throat> In the Southern Ocean, ocean bottom pressure alone uh, has as much skill as any other combination or more. Uh, so um, we uh, continue uh, and for the results for the Southern Ocean, I'll show just based on ocean bottom pressure. Um, okay, before I go on, are there any questions before I continue this? I see nothing in the chat so far. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so at this point, we want to kind of try to uh, step back and try to understand why uh, or uh, what are the causes of uh, the high skill uh, that we see. And uh, <clears throat> so to do this, we uh, uh, one thing we do is uh, limit the number of actual zonal points of, of the variables that we use. Uh, so for example, in the Atlantic Ocean in red, I'm showing the uh, correlation of the reconstructed time series with, with the actual model time series is a function of the number of zonal points. So instead of using, uh, say, 80 zonal points across the Atlantic, the, the, full, uh, the full number of zonal points in the model, uh, I'm just using 20 uh, uh, equi um, equally spaced top points, uh, or 15 or 10, and so on. Um, where, where the first point I use is the westernmost point, the western boundary point. So we see that with even just a single point, um, this uh, technique does very well. And with two points, it basically is high as, as anything else. Um, and uh, and the, the rationale for this is, is geostrophy, basically. So the, if you just know the, uh, the pressure, uh, the pressure, uh, uh, grid, uh, the mean pressure gradient across the across the, the basin, then you know the total uh, transport across it. Uh, and it turns out that most of the while the mean is determined by both, you know, the, the total gradient, the, the difference between east and west, the variability is controlled by the the western point, and that's because of uh, the rotation of the Earth causing what's called Rossby waves, uh, or most of the variability in the ocean to travel towards the west to to, to the western boundary. Um, so that's that's consistent with with some previous results uh, in the literature for the Atlantic uh, cited here. Uh, in the Southern Ocean, we were also surprised. Uh, what well, there are no Western boundaries to kind of uh, uh, to allow for this effect, but still a small number of points still produced a very high correlation. Just ten points still has 29 correlation, uh, and that's the, this blue solid line and. One, and this is an average over uh, many different uh, choices of where to place these points because there's no, for the Atlantic, I started at the Western boundary. For the Southern Ocean at 60 South, there's no boundary. So where, where do I place these equally space points? So depending on where I place them, even with five points, I can have a correlation between 0.5 and over 0.9 even. So why is that? So let's look at uh, just using just one point uh, at 60 South and using just ocean bottom pressure. And let's see the, the skill or correlation of the mock reconstruction depending on the la longitude of that point. Um, so we see that there's the strong differences here and the uncertainties in the dash line. So the uncertainty is relatively small. Um, and these uh, the peaks in the correlation or, or the regions which uh, have the most skill, the reconstruction, have to do with the uh, uh, bathymetric ridges or sea bottom ridges. So we see uh, the highest peak uh, around uh, 50 east, which is where, uh, sorry, 50 uh, west, or is where uh, the Drake Passage and it's called the Scotia Arc, this large bathymetric ridge are. And we see uh, an, another peak at 150 west, which is the Pacific Antarctic Ridge. And another one here, it's a bit harder to see, but there's uh, there's a deep basin here, the NW basin, and it's at its eastern flank. Uh, so this is in line with the study of uh, uh, presented earlier uh, by Stuart and Hogg, and another study by uh, Stuart, myself, and, and other collaborators last year, which has shown that um, 
bottom uh, pressure uh, variations, what's called bottom foam stress uh, uh, along bathymetric uh, contours. Um, uh, we present well the, uh, the uh, volubility in this region and is in line with previous theory as well. So it turns out that not only do they, um, in general, uh, th those, the volubility along the bottom bathymetry is, is, uh, determines the, the, zone, the mirror transport, but that just looking at a few of these locations or one of these locations is, is enough for uh, constraining a lot, of, a lot of the transport. So it's empirically, it's a stronger result. Uh, and we've examined this with a bit more detail using two methods from what's called uh, machine learning interpretability. Uh, so one is the method of permutation. So if you have a neural network and you have uh, say one variable ocean bottom pressure as a function of longitude and you feed it at different, from different times, T1, T2, different uh, time samples, then you take one of these longitudes, say 50 east, uh, and you reshuffle the variable in time. Uh, and then after you train the neural network and you present this uh, shuffle data to neural, neural network again, and you see if, uh, how large was the decrease in the reconstruction scale. So if this uh, longitude is very important for the reconstruction, there will be a, a large decrease. And uh, you can see it here, the reconstruction scale with this permutation test has decreased strongly for uh, uh, Drake passage and the end of the basin, similarly to what we saw earlier. Another method is layer-wise relevance propagation. And in that, uh, after we train the neural network, we track changes in the output. Uh, we track how much of it is attributed to different elements, so different neurons, <clears throat> and then different positions, different longitudes. Uh, we track it backward across the neural network. And this is the questions for that I won't go into. Uh, <clears throat> in order to know, excuse me, <clears throat> in order to understand the uh, relevance of different positions and actually determine uh, the mock by the neural network. And you can see the results here in blue, the relevance of different longitudes. And again, there are large peaks around Drake passage and they are uh, highly correlated with the small, you know, fine variations in the bathymetric depth in red and likewise in the end of the basin. Um, so these are all pretty much consistent with each other. They're not supposed to tell exactly the same story, this one and, and, and this one. In this one, we just you looked at the, at the scale of with one uh, input uh, position, whereas here we looked at uh, scale with all positions, but how is, it, how is the scale uh, dependent on different positions? So uh, qualitatively, they're consistent. And that, uh, that is in line uh, with the theoretical understanding. And I think, I, I want to wrap, wrap up soon, so there may be time for questions, uh, but I'll just uh, uh, quickly present the uh, application of this methodology to uh, across different ocean basins. So starting at the Southern Ocean, what we're seeing here in, in solid blue is the coefficient of determination. So again, a little bit, a little bit like co correlation squared or the fraction of viability captured by the reconstruction. And we see it's very high. Um, across the different latitudes, uh, similar to what we saw at 60 South. There's a drop near the Antarctic continent, and we've examined whether uh, including uh, variables related to the to sea ice uh, can help there, since those are also observed, um, but that, that wasn't the case in this study at least. Uh, and you can see linear regression as a benchmark in the dotted line, and you see the scale is very low. And furthermore, using a six-month low-pass filter, again, in solid blue, is, uh, still has high uh, skill. Uh, now the Atlantic uh, mock. So we see, again, here on the left, the skill is, uh, or uh, R squared is a function of latitude. And it's quite high everywhere, except for uh, in the, uh, in the uh, equatorial region. And that's probably due to the breakdown of geostrophic balance there. So we don't expect uh, those uh, pressure variables to be a good predictor of uh, meridional uh, transport anymore. Um, and surprisingly, in the Atlantic, we see that linear regression works fairly well. Um, so uh, uh, it seems that potentially the, uh, the fact that this is this might be due to the fact that it's an intermediate rather than a, a basal cell. 
And so the pressure uh, gradients along the, the boundary rather than along the more, more the rougher bottom uh, play, uh, play a role there. And the deviation sort of when you average your uh, geostrophic balance over a, over a finite resolution, the deviation from the uh, unaveraged equation wouldn't be large. It's one possible explanation, but it's something I, I would like to further explore. With the six month low pass filter, it doesn't do as well uh, at all latitudes as in the Southern Ocean, but still does decently. Again, this is over 80% capture of the uh, variability uh, uh, across most latitudes. And I'll just mention that some of the breakdowns, for example, at around 10 South or 40 North, uh, seem, uh, are uh, especially collocated with uh, where there are large uh, detachments of uh, boundary currents. So there, there are different there are, uh, uh, different dynamic regimes that are called them. And happy to talk about uh, my thoughts about that later. Uh, and uh, finally, the Indo-Pacific region, fairly high scale, are over about eighty percent uh, uh, variability accounted for without filtering. A bit a bit uh, lower than in the other basins. Uh, and it doesn't do as well with the six months low pass filter. And it might be better uh, this to uh, separate the Indian and Pacific regions to uh, smaller patches. It might be too much to do them, uh, to try to uh, understand them, um, uh, sorry, reconstruct them as, uh, as one system due to all the different uh, complicated bathymetry that cause them. But that's beyond the scope of the present study. I'll just summarize now. Um, so uh, we use satellite observables based, uh, satellite observables to uh, reconstruct the mock. Uh, and this is a proof of concept study within a numerical model or state estimate. We find that one or several neurons, uh, uh, Bayesian neural network is sufficient for uh, reproducing most of the uh, variability in many cases. Uh, required training time for sort of peak performance is about 10 years, so less than satellite record. Ocean volume pressure uh, consistently has the most skills in different basins. Uh, skill in the Southern Ocean is higher than benchmark dynamic approach by Stuart uh, L21 that we had last year, as I've mentioned earlier, uh, considerably higher. Uh, we find that the highest skill in the Southern Ocean is due to uh, um, values near uh, ocean ridges and just those regions alone are sufficient for high skill. Uh, and we found globally high skill uh, in, in most latitudes, we capture 80% of the variability and even with limited zone information. Uh, so we've submitted this manuscript recently uh, and I'll, uh, thank you all for, uh, for tuning in. And if you have any questions, I'd be very happy to try to address them. Uh, yeah, please, Clara. I see you. Have your hand up. Oh, it's just a clap. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, thank you. <laughs> so any questions uh, <clears throat> for Abby? If not, uh, I have a naive question. Um, is there any study that has been done on these currents uh, like uh, before? any geo major activity and after activity, like uh, earthquake kind of thing? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, yeah, not that I know of, yeah. That's not aware of any studies like that. That's this, uh, like, uh, that must be changing some, some flow and some, yeah, well, what, what what I can think of right now is uh, this is you know they can induce landslides, submarine landslides, uh, which may affect the cascade of, of dense water and ultimately their transport. Yeah, so that's that's an interesting thing to think of. Thank you. Thank you. See something in the chat here. Um, so um, I have a question from uh, A. Morris. How is your machine learning analysis affected by the variability of climate change? Does it deter the accuracy of the output model? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so, right. So we're not, in this study, 
we're not trying to understand to pre to reconstruct sort of uh, trends. Um, so basically, how uh, the probability might change when climate actually changes. Uh, so in this, you know, we had a more modest goal here, but I think I think that's maybe the holy grail in sort of reconstructing the mock accounting. Try to predict it uh, under climate change. And uh, th there is some indication that might work. Uh, we have collaborators working on with a, with actually with a high resolution model, uh, but which has been run for longer years and sort of in slightly different climate uh, regimes. And they, they find that they can train it on one regime or sort of a small set of regimes and apply it to another one um, to, to some degree. Uh, so it's not skillful everywhere. And I think it remains to be seen how much that can be done. We have some ideas for doing that, uh, which basically revolve about, around transfer learning and training on different uh, climate regimes and different numerical models even. Um, hopefully that answers the question. Do you want to follow up? Uh, please do. Uh, I see. Uh, maybe I should. Okay, uh, can you outline uh, the stages? Because I am I understand that correctly. You have Echo Four, which is kind of big supercomputing solution. Yeah, uh, and uh, that's what you start with. And what you do, you kind of compress the data. Basically, you extract it. Uh, the I mean, sub data you intend to work with. Mm. And um, yeah, this is what uh, as one of the slides I'm interested in. in and, uh, and then you do preparation, which basically means like remove trends, uh, pick up something else, just collapse something to. Can you outline more detailed way what you do and what to expect from each stage? Because mm. Mm, like, yeah. uh, like you see, model was kind of miss. I mean, it has some drifts, it has some data simulation, it has all kind of things which uh, you probably do not know and you do not want to know actually in this technique because it's uh, it's machine learning after that and model for you is just generation of uh, some quasi real data, I would say, yes. yeah. in a good quantities because machine learning implies that you have a lot of data, but you don't know not, what, uh, and what, uh, what, yeah. ki what kind of stages to understand. Like okay. to say, what kind of objects you start with, like dimensions, gigabytes of data, oh, and okay. what you reduce it toward, and what you expect to get. Okay, I'll, I'll try to address it. Well, well, just to start at almost at the end, it's not, um, it's not a lot of data. Um, you know, in terms of the number of time samples, just two two hundred eighty eight time samples. So it's desirable to have many more. Um, um and as, as i've addressed in the in the previous question um and uh let's see so yeah uh one clarification which i think you, you you've actually done at, at the end but this is not this study is not meant to kind of prove that uh to, to kind of say this is the actual mock or to reconstruct the actual mock it's we're just using a as you say a quasi realistic or as in in some regard that the, the the most realistic uh simulation of the ocean and circulation uh, uh, to just provide us with the input data in order to test our methodology. So what do we do here in a bit more detail? Um, so we use, we choose one specific latitude at a time. And, uh, mm -hmm. and then we uh, take the distribution of, uh, of several variables, which are uh, in principle satellite observable, meaning they are currently observed by satellite and use the oceanography, but here we'll take them from the model. So we just sample the zonal wind stress and the sea surface height and the ocean bottom pressure, or one of them, depending, you know, I've shown different examples. But uh, you see, for, okay, one, one sec. Uh, here you have, uh, seems to me that it is around the globe from minus 80 to plus 80, but you actually have continents. Right, uh, right. Yeah, and, so, yeah, so here. So you continue. should not have data there, right? Yeah, it depends. So for 60 South, you have no, for this one, yes. uh -huh. here are the masks we apply. So for the, for the Atlantic, this is, I see what you're saying. There's, there's a mistake here. I'm showing you variables everywhere. I should, also, I should only show it for 
you know, mm. the green patch here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Thanks for pointing that out. Um, yeah. And then uh, let's see, where were we? Here. Yeah. So we take those and then for zonal wind stress, we remove, we just take this, uh, the um, zonal mean of that because we know from, you know, Ekman, what's called Ekman uh, flux basic theory that the zonal mean will determine the zone, wind uh, flux, wind, wind force flux. And then the reason for uh, the trending is again that we've been, it's, it's a limited length of time set. So we didn't want to try to say something about the trend, which uh, might not be oriented in uh, such a, a small amount of data and uh, relatively simple architecture. And we, uh, we decision here, I didn't write it down here. We decision as well, not interested in the sort of regular seasonal oscillations. Uh, and we rescale uh, by the standard deviation. And that's basically a standard machine learning uh, pre-processing step, which is uh, um, empirically uh, really improves the uh, performance of neural network training. It does and, not really uh, that way. Yes, yeah. and just rational for that, if I understand that correctly, right? Say, if you study in stock market, for example, your goal is basically to uh, split your signals into like long-term trends and some daily variation, which you then try to study actually, right? Because otherwise you will get some aliases or some, I do not know how to, like, yeah. I'm, I'm, I trying to, I'm trying to understand how robust is this technique basically mm. because uh, one obviously fundamental assumption is that what is been there that's what is happened next in future because uh, yeah, yeah. You, you learn some kind of uh, laws of physics you do not know about and you cannot really formulate it but then you presume that they will continue and right. mm -hmm. uh, what happened if you would not get trend for example yeah, so without the trending, we still have in many altitudes significant skill. So in many altitudes, it doesn't deteriorate, mm -hmm. um, but in others it did. And I, I did not look at some point. I started the trending, and there was somewhat of an improvement. And I was I thought un, un, unrelated to the improvement. I thought it's the right way to go for this particular study uh, to aim for that. Uh, but it seemed it seemed to do quite well. But I don't know statistically how. Uh, how well uh, the trend uh, can be expected to, to be captured here. Um, so we chose to, to focus on that. And regarding you know, the change in physics or uh, the you know, sort of constitutive relations in sort of in future, I think you know, there was the previous question was just on that. Um, and as I said, I think it's a good question. We're not, we haven't dealt with that here, but we have some reason to think that there could be some skill and then we hope, uh, we have some ideas for how to just transfer learning for that after training on different uh, climate regimes, potentially. Mm. But yeah, that's to be explored still. Thank you. Good question. There is a question from Daniel. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks, Dan uh, thanks, Daniele. Uh, so Daniele is writing, Um, I was intrigued by the analysis of which variables have the most predictive power. Does what you find fit your physical understanding and does it provide new physical insights? Um, right, so I, I think that uh, it's particularly so surprising uh, in the Southern Ocean. I mean, it fits what we expect that uh, I think that the ocean bottom pressure will be the most skillful, uh, but the, how skillful it is it's surprising, um, and the fact that is, uh, you know, so skillful even when you limit it to just one point, specific points, ridge systems. The fact that the bottom, uh, pre the bottom foam stress is so localized is interesting because theoretically it's um, it's not quite a, a local quantity. It's something that when you look at the zonal uh, integral, uh, is you know is the is a controlling factor, but locally. It's, it's not clear, uh, not, not clear how local I should be. So that was uh, a nice surprise. Yeah, uh, thank you. <laughs> sure. Yeah, it, on. It, one interesting thing, you start with satellite observation and then you find that the bottom <laughs> pressure, it's very, it's so- yeah. I, I mean, it, it, is, it is observed by satellite. Okay. Yeah. 
Surprisingly, yeah. <laughs> what, what do you mean? Bottom pressure by satellite? Yeah, yeah. That's the uh, uh, NASA GRACE mission. The it's, it's probably something very indirect. Yeah, I missed that from the introduction. Thank, thanks for No, no problem. It's, it's based on gravimetry. So, uh, you know, it's associated with the slight changes to a satellite's uh, trajectory in space. Yeah, no, I, 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 you know, I, I know yeah. this, but because uh, they also managed to measure depths, at least some estimation of ocean most of ocean areas actually measured this way by microgravity and not by direct measurements. If you're talking remote areas, I see. But th 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 does your analysis guide some like simplified, more physically based model potentially? The sort of um, dynamics. Right. Uh, I mean, I think that would be great to do. Um, so in the Atlantic, that was already sort of uh, basically, you know, we've we've uh, confirmed some some previous uh, results, which have shown that the western boundary is really uh, the viability there is really important uh, due to Rossby waves, basically. So that's you know that's a simple model in itself. Um, for the Southern Ocean, again, it seems like uh, potentially uh, one uh, 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 just local bottom form stress. Uh, should be a good predictant. And again, it's not a local quantity, but maybe there should be a way to, to kind of theoretically show uh, that, that, you know, that it has some locality to it, perhaps. <laughs> good. <clears throat> so uh, if there is no more questions, uh... Let's uh, thank uh, Abby for thank you, the question to ask, and uh, see you maybe next uh, next month uh, in another presentation. Okay, so, thank you, Abby. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Thank everyone. See, see you. See you.